Assalamu alaikum and good morning to everyone. Uh, welcome to Apna Merit webinar. So today I'm going to talk about recent advances in neurosciences and special focus on surgical neurophysiology, uh, which can help us in improvement the post-operative patient outcome. It's a different type of topic, uh, and most of people might, there may be not too many people familiar with the, uh, the topic, so I'm just going to give us some little bit brief overview and some uh, special circumstances where uh, we can use that. So just giving you my background, uh, I did my medical school from Khyber Medical College in Peshawar in 1991. Uh, after my training in general surgery and radiology, I did my post-graduation in biomedical engineering from Case Western Research University in uh, Cleveland. <clears throat> I did my um, training in uh, surgical neurophysiology in Michigan. Uh, after that, I did my uh, uh, American Board of Neuro. So I'm a diplomat of uh, American Board of Neurophysiological Monitoring. It's a special diplomat uh, board only for intraoperative monitoring. Um, and that was in 2003. Uh, I was uh, awarded fellowship by American Society of Neurophysiological Monitoring. Uh, I'm also board member of American Society of Neuromonitoring. I'm a chairman of uh, their membership and awards committee. Uh, we just had our annual meeting last week. I was chair of their conference. So uh, I'm also uh, adjunct professor for uh, intra neurosurgical neurophysiological program in near Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I'm also involved with uh, research and publication and an, an assistant editor for a neurodiagnostic journal, which is published in uh, US. So today I'm just going to talk about uh, a brief history of surgical neurophysiology and uh, introduction and going to talk a little bit about different modalities which are, um, and then application of neuro, uh, surgical neurophysiology and some advancement from uh, over the year and research, some research uh, topics and post-operative outcome. So just talking about the History in 1947, Dawson et al. They did the first uh, recorded the first brain response by electrical stimulation of the peripheral nerve. They published that in Journal of Neurology and Neurosurgery uh, in 1947. Uh, going forward in 19, early 60s and 70s, evoke potential was still new and the clinical application was unclear, and they were still being used in mostly clinical and outpatient studies. Uh, the evoke potential used for human diagnostic, um, uh, the visual evoke potential were used, started using in for multiple sclerosis by Halliday in 1972. Auditory evoke potential uh, started in 1975 for multiple sclerosis and then for CPA tumor in 74 and 77, the multiple publication. Somatosensory evoke potential uh, were used for peripheral nerve a diagnostic in the first paper published was by uh, Bargemini in 1965 and later by Halliday in 63 uh, and Fukushima in 1975 about uh, use of somatosensory evoke potential in uh, for myelopathy. Uh, in 1969, 71, 72 other papers were published for spinal cord injury and then for later in 1958 the first part for cortic for diagnostic of the cortical lesions. So going to the evoke potential milestone, 1947, the first evoke potential was recorded in 1971, the auditory evoke potential, and 62 to 74, 68 to 1972, the first diagnostic use were performed for evoke potential. In 1972, the description of monitoring principles were described and uh, in 1977 to 78, the first spinal cord intraoperative monitoring series was published by Dr. Nash in Cleveland. And 78 to 82, and 82, the first intracranial intraoperative monitoring series was published by Levine et al. So uh, until 60s and 70s, the evoke potential were used as a as a diagnostic tool, and later in 70s especially in Cleveland, Dr. Nash and Sharam in Germany. So they started, uh, they were having issues with the patient in surgery and having deficit 
during the surgery, so they decided and spoke to the neurophysiologist and asked them if they can help in the neuro in the surgeries and prevent any surgical and uh, neurological deficit. So somatosensory evoke potential was the first one. It was introduced in scoliosis surgery in the OR, but it was had a lot of issues with noise and and the machine was too big uh, compared to the current equipment. This was followed by the motor evoke potential, which were which were uh, FDA approved in 2000. So it was a big back gap of almost 30 years between sensory and motor evoke potential. And initially, the sensory evoke potential and auditory evoke potential were used for almost two decades. So development of the principle about the evoke potential. Uh, so it was realized that there's a technology which is available and that can be used for the benefit of the patient. Uh, and that can be used for diagnostic and spinal injury. That was in early 70s by Nash et al., uh, also Dr. Brown, uh, and then use of experimental cord injury and the concept of reversible degree of injury. So that was developed over the years. So when the evoke potential were introduced in the operating room, the concept of, concept of intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring was developed, which was kind of functional Functionally guided uh, neurosurgery and spine surgery because there was no CT scan and MRI present at that time. So again, the first steps uh, taken was the use of evoke potential in uh, in spinal cord injuries, and then the uh, Broadkey Croft they published paper in for reversible spinal cord trauma. Uh, Tamaki uh, et al. They published another paper in 1972 about cord, cord physiology and injury and myelopathy and, and, and monkey uh, spinal cord injury. So there was a first publication of intracranial monitoring was published by Levine et al. in 1978 uh, by use of evoked potential for diagnostic of hearing loss. So this is a pic just giving you a picture of uh, the first meeting uh, which was held in 1981 in uh, Japan. Uh, that, was, that was the first international symposium. So what is surgical neurophysiology? So the surgical neurophysiology, uh, there's a term which is derived from neurophysiological monitoring and it is defined by American Society of Neurophysiological Monitoring as any measure which is taken to um, are used to assess the functional integrity of the peripheral nervous system or central nervous system in either in the operating room or any uh, acute care setting. So that is called neurophysiological monitoring. The purpose of surgical neurophysiology or intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring, also known as now as IONM, is to reduce the incidence of iatrogenic and injuries and randomly induce neurological injuries to the patient while it's being operated during uh, various types of surgical procedure. The IONM uh, uh, gives a different benefit, uh, which, which are improved patient care, reduce the patient neurological deficit, improve surgical morbidity and mortality, reduce hospital stay and medical cost because the patient is recovering better, reduce overall insurance burden if there's insurance involved or if a, a reduce burden on the families and doctor, which can be caused by neurological deficit due to injuries during the surgery. So there are three main um, benef benefits of utilizing intraoperative monitoring. The, uh, the first one is increased safety of the surgical procedure. So when we are using or testing uh, during the surgery, so we can increase the surgical uh, uh, the safety of the patient. The second one is increased ability to accommodate more complex cases. So when you have the interoperative monitoring and somebody is testing the patient while the surgeon is operating, you can, the surgeon is more uh, confident to do a more complex cases. It also decreases the risk of adverse surgical outcomes. So those are the three major issues, uh, benefit. So. If we just look at a, in a broad uh, view that uh, when the patient go for surgery, the surgery can last from few hours to many, many hours. It could be a five, six, seven, or 10 hour surgery. 
And if at the end of surgery, we ask the patient to wake up. We try to wake up the patient, and when the patient wake up, a uh, patient may not be able to move his legs, one leg or both leg or arm, or may have some deficit, sensory deficit, cannot feel the fingers or foot, or cannot hear, uh, have a hearing loss, or hearing deficit, or visual loss, or memory loss, or damage to the cranial nerve. And depending on what type of surgery it was, it was a spine surgery, brain surgery, brain stem surgery, um, cardiac surgery, ENT surgery, so it can cause some neurological deficit. And when we assess the patient at the end of the surgery, it's too late to figure it out what happened at what time. We cannot tell. And, the, and most of the time, uh, the damage is permanent. So it's not possible to re even you go back and try to decompress or do something, the damage has been done. So it's irreversible procedure. So by using the neurophysiological mounting in the operating room, we can identify the changes within seconds to minutes, maximum one few minutes, and inform the surgeon, anesthesia, and the team. Uh, and everyone knows what happened in the last few minutes. And it's much easier to reverse the procedure or to make some changes or uh, help the patient immediately because the change, if you can identify within few minutes, you can, uh, the damage is not permanent. It's, it's transient and we can prevent any permanent damage. So uh, neurophysiological monitoring, I have categorized into four different topics, uh, subjects. The first one is diagnostic or clinical neurophysiology, which everyone is familiar with. The diagnostic clinical neuro neurophysiology is the use of evoked potential for diagnostic purposes for diagnostic, uh, diagnosing uh, different type of disease, such as using EEG for epilepsy uh, diagnosis or using visual evoke potential or sensory evoke potential for diagnosing of multiple sclerosis or peripheral neuropathies, using EMG for myopathies, and using auditory evoke potential for hearing. So all those uh, transcranial Doppler for intracranial vessel spots or stroke. So using all of those evoke potential for diagnostic purpose uh, is called diagnostic evoke uh, neuromonitoring. Uh, it can be used for prognostic purpose if the patient is in ICU or acute uh, uh, so we can use the evoke potential for diagnosing if the patient is getting better or worse. A uh, patient might be in status of epileptics uh, or subclinical seizure or patient even have a stroke. We can use evoke potential to prognose, to see if the patient is prognosing uh, or not. Neurophysiological monitoring also now re recently has started using in therapeutic purposes. The most common is use of deep brain stimulation for treatment of Parkinson disease, essential tremor, dystonia, obesity, epilepsy. So use of implant uh, electrode in the brain and treatment of that. Also focus ultrasound for treatment of dissolving the uh, emboli. The last one is the neurointeroperative or neurophysiology, which I'm going to talk in more detail. So it's production of the neural pathway uh, from mechanical or ischemic injuries. So what is uh, intraoperative monitoring, which is also known as surgical neurophysiology? So intraoperative monitoring or surgical neurophysiology offers protection of neural tissues and organs, such as brain, spinal cord, and peripheral nerves during the surgery. If there is an irritation uh, or an injury to the, those pathway, there are, there's a change in the signal and the identification we can identify very quickly, and we can immediately inform the surgeon and we reduce the and the surgeon can change the, uh, the procedure or stop the procedure, and that can uh, prevent any permanent damage. The neurophysiological mounting is currently used as standard of care for scoliosis surgeries. So there are different type of modalities. So modality is a term which is used for the uh, electrophysiological or neurophysiological test. So the test we do um, in the operating room or in the clinic, they are known as modality. So the most common one is known as SSAT, or somatosensory evoke potential. Uh, sensory evoke potential are used for protecting the sensory pathway, which are ascending pathway in the spinal cord. The other one is motor evoke potential. Transcranial motor evoke potential is the uh, is, uh, modality which is used for testing 
the descending pathway or motor pathway emg can be used for uh, measuring the activity of the cranial nerve or peripheral nerve and avoiding any damage to the those nerve uh, emg can be free run or triggered triggered is for yes stimulating the nerves and uh, identifying the nerve or confirming the integrity of the nerve eeg can be used also or electrocorticography which is eeg directly from the brain for protecting the brain ischemia during different type of procedure um, direct electrical cortical stimulation is a motor cortex identification uh, brain stem BAER is a bears are for auditory pathway protection VEP or visual evoke potential or protecting for visual pathway TCD or transcranial Doppler is for brain ischemia or blood flow and MER or microelectrode recording is to identify the nucleus for placement of deep brain st uh, stimulator implant so those are different types of modalities I'm going to just give you some so there are so the, there are different modalities every modality is testing a different pathway in the body but there's no way we can use one or we should not never use one modality and assume that everything is fine so initially when the scoliosis case surgeries were performed in 1970 so the only test possible was sensory evoke potential and uh, it was being used and assuming that if the sensory pathway is okay motor should be okay but that was not and there were there was a risk of having damage to the motor pathway without any changes in sensory evoke potential so as a rule so we do multi-modality monitoring uh, which means that we monitor as many tests as possible so we don't monitor just one uh, test so we we include sensory monitoring motor monitoring auditory monitoring cranial nerve depending on the type of surgery or or, or the structure at risk we have we do as many tests as possible to make sure we give the best coverage to the patient so it has application in various type of surgery uh, neurosurgery, orthopedic surgery, general surgery, ENT surgery, cardiac surgeries, interventional procedure, uh, urological procedures. Uh, neurosurgery has wide range of application from spinal surgeries to tumors to fusion, stellar cord, cord equina, brain tumor, brain stem tumor, carry malformation, fourth ventricular tumor, cortical tumor, dorsal rhizotomy, brachial plexus injuries, repairs, cortical stimulator implant, microvascular decular aneurysm repair. So, uh, orthopedic for fusion, scoliosis, hip replacement, sacroiliac joint fusion, uh, TB osteotomy, leg lengthening for uh, general surgery and ENT, th thyroid surgery, facial nerve tumors, parotid tumors, thyroid tumors, uh, cochlear implant, cardiac surgery for cabbage, carotid endorectomy, aortic aneurysms, valve replacement, uh, interventional for coiling aneurysms. Uh, in, AVM embolization, intracranial embolization, spinal cord embolization, and carotid stents, uh, prostate surgery. So all these surgeries, uh, it's a long list. And so every time there's a risk of the neural structure, so we can do testing. So the first test is, um, I'm going to try to go as uh, just a summary. So somatosensory evoke potential, which is sensory evoke potential. So somatosensory evoke potential is a test which is used which is done by stimulating a peripheral nerve. We stimulate uh, nerves in the upper extremity and lower extremity. So we can stimulate median nerve, an ulnar nerve in hand or posterior tibial nerve, peroneal nerve, deep peroneal nerve, or femoral nerve, or, uh, or sural nerve in the lower extremity and record from the spinal cord, brain stem, and brain. Uh, and it gives information about, it has 95 to 98% specificity to sensory neurological event. So if there's any changes in the sensory pathway, or it's, um, so it monitors only dorsal column. And the dorsal column, the test we are monitoring is proprioception. So the proprioception test, stereognosis, which is the shape and structure, uh, to weight discrimination, two-point discrimination. So all those tests, they are monitored by the somatosensory work potential. The only sensory uh, by using the sensory evoke potential, SSCP, we do not do spinal thalamic pathway because the spinal thalamic pathway is a lateral pathway, is a different than the dorsal column pathway, uh, which has pain and temperature. So we do not, if there's a change in that, it cannot be monitored by using sensory evoke potential. So um, if you can see, the, so th these are recordings, there are multiple recording sites and the wave so forms. For upper extremity, we have brachial recording from the brachial plexus and the cortex. For lower extremity, we record from popliteal fossa in the leg and then spinal cord and the cortex. 
and so the signals are produced uh, it takes nine milliseconds for uh, signal to appear in brachial plexus for upper extremity 13 milliseconds in the brain stem and 20 milliseconds in the contralateral cortex for the lower extremity it takes about 37 milliseconds for the response to appear so we put the electrode on the scap and do multiple recording and all those electrodes are placed uh, plugged into the, the computer so now, now the computers are very very sophisticated so 20 years more than 20 years ago when I started the neuro mounting so the machine I use we were using it has only four channel and you can do only four inputs at one time but now we have 64 input system and we can do up to uh, multiple and as many tests as possible So this again, uh, same diagram for uh, sensory evoke potential. The sensory evoke potential is stimulation of the nerves in the upper and lower limbs, and then recording. We place the electrode in different according to the international 1020 system, uh, which is we put the electrode on the scalp, and then we plug into the machine and record from the. Uh, so I have uh, responses. The first lower response, if you can see, is R point, which is brachial plexus. And the second response is from the brainstem, and the, the third one on the top is from the somatosensory cortex. So what we are looking for is from peak to trough, uh, peak to peak uh, amplitude, the height, and the time it takes from stimulation to the, the first response. So if there's a change in the amplitude, the signal is decreased in size. Uh, more than 50% or there's a change in more than 10% uh, latency increase in time that's alarming we can inform the surgeon uh, so and we can stop the surgery right away and have to identify so when we are sitting in the you are sitting in the computer so if you are doing just sensory evoke potential you will have four windows then the first one is left median nerve the second one is the right median the third one is the left posterior tibial nerve in the leg and the right one the fourth one is right posterior tibial nerve. So if you look at, so we have signals, but the left one, the left hand signals are disappeared. So if the signals are disappeared, so you have to immediately, we have to find out the reason. It could be technical stimulation problem. It could be recording problem. It could be change, too much cuff, cuff pressure on the, on the arm or the patient position, pressure on the brachial plexus, which has nothing to do with the surgery. So, um, anything can cause that, so you have to identify that and tell the surgeon. So anesthesia also affects our signal because the signals are produced in the brain and so anesthesia has a suppressive effect. Uh, on the right side, if you, if you look at, we can see in the second column and second, third, and fourth, uh, we have response up and down peak, which started getting delayed and then it disappeared. So surgeon was informed immediately at that time, and surgeon. Uh, took out the retractor which was causing the pressure on the brainstem and the signal came back and at the end it was as uh, at the same time latency and amplitude as the baseline so patient woke up with no deficit so those are the sens uh, sensory evoke potential so and we use sensory evoke potential for monitoring the sensory pathway the second modality we do is uh, motor evoke potential motor evoke potential for first this did described in detail in 1984 by Levy and, the, and thousands of papers published. Uh, it has very good um, uh, sense. Uh, the use of uh, wake-up test in, before introduction of motor evoke potential, uh, the surgeon used to wake up the patient uh, after putting all the, like, uh, the rods and uh, screws. They have to wake up the patient and ask the patient to move the legs and then have to put them sleep and then close. Uh, so now, because introduction of motor evoke potential, you don't need to wake up the patient, which is very difficult procedure for anesthesia and for the patient, most of the patient, especially for scoliosis, they're teenager or below, uh, they're very young uh, and they're difficult to communicate and there's a language issue and there are different issues. So what we do is we stimulate, the, we put the electrode on the, on the scalp and we stimulate with a high voltage. We can stimulate from 100 to 1,000 volt. We typically use between 100 to 300 volts. That's a short burst of stimulation, and we look for response in the muscles in the upper and lower extremity. And if there's any change in the responses, we immediately inform the surgeon, and uh, because the 
hypothermia can cause effect on sensory and motor recognition. Anesthetic agent that can suppress the signal. Blood pressure can mean artery pressure or blood pressure affect the signal. So we have to quickly identify what is the cause. If it is a blood pressure, we have to increase the blood pressure. If it's an anesthesia, we have to decrease the anesthesia. If it's hypothermia, we increase the temperature. And if it is surgical, then I inform the surgeon. So, but the point is like running those tests immediately throughout the surgical procedure, we can see the changes within second, if not second, maybe minute. Uh, EMG is also the third modality. Uh, EMG is electromyography. Um, it's typically done in clinical clinic for testing for all the muscle diseases. But we do in the OR we put the elect needles electrode in the different muscles in the upper and lower extremities. And um, if you look at this picture, so the blue is the left side, all the muscles on the left side, and the lower extremity and the right is all the red muscles. So on the left side, the surgeon is irritating, is working on the on the nerves, and the nerves are getting irritated because of manipulation, and there's a lot of this abnormal signals on the left side. So the right side, there's no abnormality, but the left side. So if something happens, we inform the surgeon right away. Um, we we can connect to, to the microscope and look at the patient, um, what the surgeon is performing or doing, and inform the surgeon right away. So EMG is, is normally also used for particle screw testing. So if you are if you are putting screws, if you there are a lot of surgeries for trauma, scoliosis, there are a lot of uh, screws and rods and instrumentation is done, and that screw can uh, because uh, can get out of the bone. So if it is not placed, there's a risk always a risk of placing the electrode uh, not in the bone, and if it is, there's a breach or break in the bone, it will touch the spinal cord or nerve. And patient, it can cause foot drop or patient paralysis. So if we are uh, doing the monitoring, uh, we can test the screws. We can stimulate the screws with the current and uh, get a response. And if the response is too low, that means there's a break. The accuracy on the there are multiple studies done. The accuracy of using a fluoroscopy or X-ray in the OR to identify the breach is about 60, 65 percent accurate. Compared to using the stimulation and the testing the nerve is about 96 percent accurate. So you can have a small breach which doesn't show up on the on the X-ray or CM, but it will pick, be picked up more chances of picking up by the testing. So if it is a clear breach, we will lose sensory potential, motor potential because the spinal cord is damaged. But if there's a small micro breach, so we stimulate the nerve and we get a response. And depending on what is the threshold or what is the intensity of the response, uh, we can we can identify if the patient has a breach. So this is just a picture of uh, showing the response. So this, how the response will appear on the screen. Again, looking for the EMG. So when the patient even wakes up or getting light, we we can tell all the muscles start twitching, and we can tell the surgeon. So there are multiple. Just giving you an example of one of the tests which was done by the Benthel et al. Uh, they divided the two groups in group one and group two. Group one, they used uh, they used no monitoring, and they had 185 patients. Group two had 205 patients, and they used uh, needle pedicle screw stimulation. So the first group without monitoring, they had 9.6% uh, incidence of radiculopathy. As compared to the second group, it has less than 1%. Train of four is another test we which we do to identify if the patient is, has muscle relaxant on the butt board or not because many, many times in, in order to give patient anesthesia, you have to give muscle relaxant. Um, but how long, and we don't know how long it will take for the muscles to recover, so we do interoperative testing. Another test we do, uh, modality we use is brainstem auditory vocal potential. They are also known as BEARS or ABR. Um, and there are five different peaks, so we stimulate, we put the um, insert in the ear and stimulate with the click sound is a sound stimulation, and we can record from the, on the, from the distal nerve, proximal nerve, from the brainstem, superiorly complex, uh, in three colliculus. So all the five, six waves we can record in, and if there's a change, if even there's a, a, a slight pressure on the nerve, it will cause delay in the signal, and we can inform the surgeon to remove. So before, uh, 
in in US before utilizing ABR in 70s, the incidence of hearing loss was about 35 to 38 percent hearing loss. After introducing uh, brainstem auditory potential, while the surgeon was working on this, uh, CPA tumor or acoustic neuroma or vestibular choroma, it moved to less than one percent. So utilization of uh, auditory vocal potential helps in preservation of the hearing and minimizing any deficit. Auditory vocal potential also can be used for vertigo. In sometimes patient has severe vertigo and you have to go and cut the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. So we can uh, record directly from the nerve and, and give the feedback which part is the vestibular part, which is the uh, cochlear part. Another modality we use is EEG. So EEG is, I think most of you are familiar with using of EEG in clinical for epilepsy and uh, other tests. So the EEG we use, we can do in during the surgery for protection and management of the patient. By using the EEG, we can do uh, prevent any cortical ischemia. Uh, it could be because, because of surgical manipulation on the vasculature. We can identify the birth suppression if the patient is in uh, is in the induced birth suppression or not due to high dose of anesthesia. We, uh, for the cardiac bypass surgery, but, uh, we can measure the cortical perfusion, and and also if, the, if you have to, you have to do uh, the cooling of the brain, we can record from the EEG. Uh, EEG gives us um, detailed information: patient is awake, sleep, and how deep it it is or um, if, there, if there's any in, in seizure activity in the, or I have any ischemia. Uh, so we can also record EEG direct from the brain. Uh, we can put the electrodes. In this picture, we have one by four, four contact electrode, which is placed, uh, the dura is open and is placed directly. And you can record uh, electrocorticography, which has much bigger, high amplitude, and we can see some, uh, ictal discharges. So if you are stimulating the brain for a brain tumor resection, so again, electrocorticography gives us a feedback, the patient going to seizures, and we can identify the seizure before patient go into real convulsion, because if the patient is in the OR table, the head is fixed, and you don't want the patient to go into the, the seizures on the table. So again, just giving, um, so to the surgical application of IM, uh, neurosurgeries, almost all type of neurosurgeries, cardiovascular surgeries, orthopedic surgeries, uh, fusions, scoliosis, hips, ENT surgeries also, every, wherever the, there's a risk of the uh, damage to the facial nerve, uh, thyroid, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve, uh, so on the order, auditory nerve, we can use, um, uh, test all those tests by using auditory vocal potential EMG. So there's always risk involved, so what's happening so the the patient is coming with a spinal trauma, hip trauma. They have to uh, we have to fix the patient. So in order to fix the patient, we don't know what is the relationship of the nerves compared to the uh, to the broken uh, bones. So manipulation can cause further damage. So if the patient has any preserved uh, function, uh, any manipulation in an, or in order to put the uh, elect, uh, the spine back at the, its initial can cause any damage. So we can monitor, do testing, sensory, motor, auditory, visual, all those testing and can prevent. For spine, we can do sensory and motor and EMG and make sure patient doesn't get worse than it, it came to the operating room. So um, a brief uh, about uh, applications. So there are different types of surgery, surgical procedures. Uh, one one was trauma, spinal trauma, uh, hip trauma, uh, also the spinal cord tumors, uh, lipomas. So anesthesia is a bigger part, so we always make sure we have to talk to anesthesia. We have to inform that what tests we are do doing and every anesthetic agent. So we usually prefer to use uh, total intravenous anesthesia, have no guess because the inhalation agent like sevoflurane, desflurane, or isoflurane and nitrous oxide, they suppress the signals a lot. So we always recommend using total intravenous, which is propofol with any remifentanil or any narcotic. So 
so uh, that was just the uh, overview. There are different tests. So what is surgical neuro neurophysiology, the history of development of the evoke potential, and different type of modality, sensory evoke potential, motor evoke potential, uh, EMG, auditory evoke potential. I did not talk about visual evoke potential, but there are also visual evoke potential. EMG and all the tests. So now uh, all those tests are the, the tests we typically use in the OR. So I'm just going to uh, giving you a list of different type of surgical procedure where the patient can benefit by utilizing. It's not, it's not only benefit for patient; it's also benefit to the surgeon uh, and the and the staff involving the t uh, the treatment of the patient because. If we are doing this um, in input in immediate or real time input to the patient or to the surgeon, sorry, uh, the surgeon can do a better job. Um, that sometimes the changes are not because of surgery; it could be because of anesthesia or change in on the on the anesthetic or temperature or mean artery pressure or blood pressure, which uh, it could be changed because of change in intracranial pressure, carbon dioxide level. So electrolyte imbalance, they all affect your, our evoke potential. So a surgeon, it might be, surgeon might be doing a very good job and have no changes, but the patient wakes up with deficit because of anesthetic or perisurgical thing. So we can give information to the anesthesia, if it is anesthesia related, or if it's surgeon related, we give information to the surgeon. So cranial nerve monitoring, uh, monitoring of the, all the cranial nerves, we can monitor all the cranial nerves except for cranial nerves cortical sensory area mapping, motor mapping, motor and language area mapping. So those cases are mostly done awake and patient has to be awake and talk to the patient. Tethered cord release, so we utilize, so in, in the past, uh, until 2000, it, it was most focused on the spinal cord or scoliosis cases and some CPA tumors, the caustic neuroma, but now we have moved forward, so there's so much research done and a lot of studies done. So the field of neurophysiology has much more application and it's being used and uh, into different fields. So clinical inner monitoring and cortical mapping is one of those. A tethered cord release, uh, using the trigger EMG, so it takes very, you can do, you can identify the phylum very, very quick and you don't and you can cut the phylum without damaging any uh, neural structure. Intramedial tumor resection is very high risk procedure. The tumor is inside the spinal cord, inside intramedullary. So if you're doing a direct motor evoke potential, direct spinal cord monitoring, we can, every micrometer or a single fiber change can cause a dramatic change in the signal and we can inform the surgeon and depending on the condition, he can decide to stop the surgery or keep continuing. So, also selective dorsal rhizotomy uh, for treatment of spastic paralysis, spinal, uh, lateral spinal procedures, they are new. So last five, six years, they're getting common and common. Uh, placement of uh, doing their uh, patient can be in the hospital and out very quickly because but the problem is the surgeon is operating through the source with blind and it, the risk of neural damage is almost 45 to 50 percent. So it's a very high, so almost half of the patient wake up with a foot drop in the damage. So, so neuro monitoring and monitoring of the nerves during those procedures is very, very uh, beneficial. Spinal call AVM embolization, same thing. So if you are embolizing the spinal call AVM, is kind of water we can test all those, um, the feeders of uh, AVM by sensory and motor, motor evoke potential before it is embolized. And if it is a major feeder, uh, we will see a change in the signal and we don't, the surgeon will not embolize because if they do embolize, patient will wake up with deficit. A spinal cord stimulator implants, and now we do a lot of patients with failed big surgery syndrome have uh, severe pain for a long time. They have spinal cord implant we can use you don't have to do surgery awake. So in the past, the surgery was being done. The surgeon uh, keep the patient awake, put the stimulator and turn on the stimulator and ask the patient where they can feel the numbness or paresthesia. But now we can localize it more precise by testing and uh, it's a left side or right side or bilateral or 
uh, as the patient has pain in the right knee, we can localize the right knee area, or left leg area, instead of and the, without the, keeping the patient awake. Again, awake surgery on the spinal cord is very, very difficult and uh, risky procedure. Also, a cortical simulator implant for the pain for a patient with severe facial pain, trigeminal neuralgia, they do, they do cortical stimulator implant, so we can localize that uh, microvascular decompression of facial nerve, um, cochlear implant, deep brain stimulation, so all those testing. So for cranial or EMGs, so, uh, neurophysiological is now is routinely used for monitoring of all the nerve except for cranial nerve number one. So the olfactory nerve is the only nerve we don't test because it gets saturated very quickly. But except that, we monitor all the nerves. The optic nerve, we use visually evoked potential and ERG for oculomotor, motor. We use uh, EMG, trochlear, trigeminal, abducen, facial. We use EMG, vestibular, cochlear. We do auditory testing, uh, glossopharyngeal, vagus, spinal accessory, hypoglossal, 12. So we do EMG and motor evoked potential and uh, uh, make sure that the there's no neurological deficit or it's, it's minimal. So cranial nerve three, four, six. So for cranial nerve three, we put electrode in the medial rectus. Uh, lateral rectus we use for cranial nerve number six. Superior oblique we use for cranial nerve three. So for any tumor involving um, frontal lobe tumors, ophthalmic aneurysm, optic nerve tumors, we use those three muscles uh, to record that. And this is just an, uh, giving you one of the cases uh, with uh, I did. So this is activity from cranial nerve 3, so we can inform the surgeon immediately that he is manipulating cranial nerve too much. Because if this activity remains there for a very long time, <coughs> it can cause uh, post-operative weakness. So this is a picture from Moller et al. published in 2010. So modern, we can put electrode in all the cranial nerves on the face and have a different responses. The first response, medial rectus on the top, uh, cranial nerve three, superior oblique, which is fourth cranial nerve, lateral rectus six, facial nerve. So we can simulate the nerves when the surgeon is working in the brain stem or fourth ventricle, or is working in the middle cranial fossa. He can stimulate or she can stimulate the nerve, and we can tell uh, which nerve it is, and we can identify the nerve. So facial nerve we typically use all the muscles, tempo, uh, frontalis, oculi, oris, mentalis, platysma, and we can identify, uh, we typically, we use for CPA tumors or acoustic neuroma. The surgery is also for uh, parotid surgery, if the patient is going into parotid tumors or something. Hemifacial spans, and then uh, another, we can stimulate the nerve, and if the patient surgeon is doing microvascular decompression, we can give them information the nerve is de decompressed or not. So it's a live feedback, immediate feedback. For the ENT surgery, so the application of neurophysiological monitoring is great. We can monitor all the five branches of the cranial nerve. You can see that we put the electrode on the face. Uh, we can stimulate, we, we can actually, we typically, we can stimulate the skin of the patient and we can mark all the branches before even making the incision. And you can see, and once the surgeon starts manipulating the parotid gland, which is very tough tissue, uh, we can identify and make sure the patient does not wake up with any facial nerve weakness. Thyroid tumor, we do monitoring the superior laryngeal nerve uh, and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. We use endotracheal tube, we put a special electrode, which is on the right side. Uh, it's placed on the endotracheal tube, and any size, it comes in pediatric and adult. Uh, on the left side, we can see stimulating the nerve, so and identifying the nerve and during the surgery and after the surgery it gives us information that there's no change uh, and there's no retraction or any extra stress on the nerve. Cortical mapping is um, just like a mapping of the brain. When you open the brain you want to know where is the sensory area, where is the motor area, where is hand motor, leg motor, bicep, so all the muscles. So uh, cortical mapping is well recognized and uh, for identification of the central surface and motor area, and it gives immediate feedback to the or live feedback to the surgeon. Uh, 
it is much cheaper to use instead of using interpreter MRI or functional MRI. Why we do cortical mapping? Because we want to preserve the vital function. We can preserve the language area, motor area. We can do more precise localization of sensory areas, motor area, and also epilepsy area by using cortical mapping. And we can maximize the extent of the resection and by avoiding any new deficit. So the cortical mapping, there are different type of mapping. There's a sensory mapping. Sensory mapping is we put the grid or, or uh, electrode on the brain and stimulate the median or the nerve on the contralateral side. And we look for response because the tumor can push the structure anteriorly, posteriorly, medial or lateral. So just looking at, at the normal side, uh, on contralateral side, we, we can guess, but you can, uh, you can see the structure, but it's very difficult to see the functional area. So we can do functional mapping by, um, and we can identify the central circus. The functional central circus might be different where it's an autonomical central circus because of the tumor. The second test for cortical mapping is the motor mapping, which is also known as direct electrical cortical stimulation. Uh, we stimulate the brain directly and we can see a response and, the, and by getting the response, we give immediate feedback if it's a motor area or not and it's easy. The surgeon should proceed by taking the tumor out in that area or making an incision. We do electrocorticography, EEG, direct from the brain at the same time. When you do brain uh, stimulation, so make sure patient doesn't go into seizures uh, or convulsion. During this, this. So we typically, this is a, just a diagram placing of the electrode. So the, the grid comes in different sizes, 1 by 4, 2 by 4, uh, 1 by 8, uh, and 4 by 8 by 8. So we put the electrode and record the signals. Uh, this is from one of... Uh, my paper published in Neurosurgeries. It's a new technique by using uh, triphasic uh, potential instead of biphasic. So just putting the grid and the recording, and you can tell the central surface is between trace number one and two because the signal is uh, same thing here. For motor stimulation, there are different techniques. One was Penfield, which was developed in, by Penfield in the 50s, and uh, Taniguchi developed another technique in 19, published in. Uh, uh, 1993 uh, for short strain stimulation. Both can be used and we can identify by stimulation, stimulation of the brain with a different frequency. Uh, and this is a picture we can see. Uh, we have spontaneous EMG, we have uh, motor responses. And if yes, in this picture, we have big response in the hand area and very small in forearm area. So we know the surgeon is stimulating the, and we are at the bottom, we are running electrocartography and we know the patient is not seizing because of stimulation. If the tumor is deep in the uh, subcortical area, we do also stimulation, and depending on the current, we can tell so how far is the, the surgeon, how far we are from the cortical tract, uh, motor tract. So every millimeter, uh, LE, we stimulate in milliampere, so every one milliampere is equal to one millimeter distance. So if we get a response at 10 milliampere, that means we are 10 millimeters from the motor tract. If we get a response at 7 milliampere, we get a response 7 millimeters far. If we get a response at 5 milliampere, that means we are just only 5 millimeters, and we do not recommend doing any tumor resection or doing any resection below 5 milliampere because the patient will have a high uh, post-operative deficit. So this patient was uh, published by Dr. Rebbe et al. in neurosurgery in 2014 from Bern, Germany. And all the patients which have lower than 3 million pair, they had a very long, almost 45-day hospital stay and longer stay. And all the patients which have more than 11 million pair, which means they, were, they stopped the surgery at uh, 11 millimeter distance, they have uh, zero delay in the discharge. So they were... So language mapping is another test we do. We, the tumor is in the language area. We go and test the patient in the preoperative, and depending, and we identify if there's any deficit or no deficit. And we do different testing, rote testing, noun testing for Broca's area, phase repetition for Broca's object memory for uh, inferior temporal area, sentence completion for Wernicke's question answers, true and false for Wernicke's word repetition. So all the different tests take almost four to five minutes to one hour. And when the surgeon is operating, the patient is awake, and we, we repeat the, all the tests, counting alphabet, days of the week, ask them to repeat that, uh, and show them pictures. So we are doing we, testing the visual fibers, auditory fibers, memory, um, verb area, noun area. So that's a lot of different tests we use for the language area. 
and the, and just want to make sure the same while the surgeon is is reflecting uh, the tumor it doesn't affect anything uh, so uh, also that's another advancement in the neurology is application in uh, epilepsy surgeries so this picture you can see they have eight by eight degrees which has foot 64 contacts and we identified this light blue area which was sensory area uh, the second one was red area which was all motor area and dark blue area was uh, the was a seer focus so the surgeon cut those uh, he 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 did not pick he left the grid on the brain he cut those area and took the tumor out without taking out the dorsal rhizotomy is another procedure so patient who have cerebral palsy they have severe spasticity so the cerebral spasticity is uh, due to damage to the upper motor neuron and and one of the treatment is to go and cut the uh, lower motor neurons 50% of the fibers 40 to 50% but if you are used and if there's no neurophysiological monitoring available the surgeon usually cut the nerves uh, just 50% nerve and but that does not have a good outcome uh, because um, you may cut the good nerves as compared to the bad nerve so what we do we cut the nerve every single rootlet root we divide into two or three roots and we stimulate with the hook electrode every root and, and we look for abnormal responses so there are different type of responses incremental clonic multiphasic and we we grade them into 0 1 2 3 4 if you stimulate the left side and you get a response from the right side or stimulate the L2 nerve root and you get a response for L5 those are abnormal so we only cut the abnormal so this that's why it's got selective rhizotomy and we and it it and of with the rehab it has very there are thousands of cases done park et al and other other so they have published a lot of data on that so use of surgical neurology in for cerebral palsy patient has absolutely great outcome so patient can walk and run post-operatively also in lipoma surgery so placement of different type of lipoma so when you're taking out the lipoma uh, and mass is difficult to identify the spinal cords and uh, the phylum. So by using EMG and trigger EMG, it's much easier. You can identify and give immediate feedback and have a good outcome. Bulbo cavernous reflex is another one for pudendal nerve stimulation. So we can stimulate the pudendal nerve and get a response and minimize any deficit. Uh, we just published this paper last week. So this is the first published published. Uh, uh, so I, we did six, page, seven patients uh, with one my uh, colleagues, and we published uh, this a new electrode. And we, uh, and if you see in the middle in, in the in the picture, so there's a thin film of electrode attached on the blood uh, urinary catheter, and the catheter is placed, and we can record direct from the uh, urethral muscle. Uh, we can do motor evoke potential and EMG. Uh, and record the potential nerve. So typically we use for anal sphincter, uh, which is, but the fiber going to sphincter are different than going to urethral area. So now we can monitor both of them. And with this, with our series, we have 100% success recording. Epidural recordings are another test. We can put the electrode right on the spinal cord and get a response and give a feedback. Fourth ventricle tumor. So we have, we can monitor, we can, we can open the fourth ventricle and there's uh, nuclei for clean of 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and we can stimulate every single nuclei and identify the nuclei and do the, do the resection without causing any damage. Uh, so just for the uh, acoustic neuroma, again, hearing, fashion nerve is the trick, so we monitor hearing, fashion nerve. Uh, so there's a lot of society in, involved in philanthropic efforts. Uh, we go to different countries and do free clinics. Now, this is one of the pictures went to one of the surgeons went to Ghana and there were a lot of kids they came for scoliosis uh, surgery and we did, I think we have 35 patients but we, select, uh, we selected the most severe one we did like 10 or 12 patients in that so scoliosis surgeries if you do correction and try to make straight the spine without monitoring it's a very risky procedure and can cause paralysis <coughs> so utilization of, of sensory and motor pathway we can stop the manipulation, uh, derotation, or fraction, and minimize the any deficit. 
trauma surgeries again have a high risk procedure. <coughs> brachial, brachial plexus mapping is another one. <coughs> so if the patient is coming with a brachial plexus injury, uh, it could be caused by the motor vehicle accident or auto accident. It could be due to, uh, uh, in fact, it can be caused by breach or uh, shoulder injury. So we have multiple type of electrodes and <coughs> we can stimulate uh, the different muscles and we could record, we have bipolar, minopolar, tripolar electrodes and we, we can record from the, the nerve across the, the damage area and we can help in identifying the trunk, uh, damage to the trunk or damage to the, the roots or distal nerve and we can identify them and help in in, re, uh, in in doing the graft. So this is one of the cases we did. So we do motor evo potential and different testing. So nerve graft, for the nerve grafting, so we are doing nerve grafting and you want to identify the the part of the nerve, if there's a, the, uh, the fibrous tissue or if it is a, a tumor or if it is neuropexia across the nerve. So we can stimulate across the nerve by the hook electrode and we can localize within an inch uh, of, the, of the damage and uh, take the dead part and identify another nerve and transplant the nerve. And another advancement is the use of neurosurgical physiology is using interventional procedures. Interventional procedures are non-surgical procedures and typically done in, in by either radiologist or neurosurgeon or non-neurologist. Uh, so uh, for the coiling of the aneurysm or embolization or embryons could be, uh, could be, so uh, the testing can be done. So, so genital femoral nerve is another technique. So uh, for the lateral procedure, genital femoral nerve is at risk. So we can do genital femoral nerve monitoring. Scoliosis surgery, just giving you um, different type of surgeries where we can use. So this is one of the case we did. We put the six electrode, and when you put the six electrode patient, uh, we lost signals, and we took out the electrode, and postoperatively we saw there was a infog to the T9 area. But because we identify within one minute and 30 seconds, the patient has a uh, weakness postoperatively, but the patient uh, recovered, and she was walking and running. Uh, uh, after one week. Carpal sclerosis again, if you have something patient like that, so uh, using, we publish this paper, so utilization of neuromounting can be very good. Sacral tumors, again, sacral tumors, so I'm just pedicle screw testing uh, from pediatric hip, hip surgery, so we did this study and uh, we have, uh, we identified retraction for 20, 50%. Anesthesia was 25% ischemia. The cause of changes was 25%. So all of these patients, they have 0% post-operative deficit. Uh, tibular osteotomy, so lengthening. So the patient with, uh, with the, uh, the bent knees. Uh, so when you do osteotomy to straighten the bend, you can cause trapment of the nerve. And we did uh, this published this paper and all the patient, 18 patients, they have no deficit. Positioning is a very, very important. So sometimes there's nothing to do, but the patient positioning in a prone position can cause changes. And uh, most of the time, their lumbar surgeries, uh, the highest instance has a lumbar. Uh, just a few more slides left. So there are two types of certification. One is called CNIM, which is Certification of Neurophysiological Monitoring. In order to, to take that, <clears throat> you can take any place in the world and you have to apply pay extra money to, for a special center. It's an American test, and you need to have a bachelor degree or higher. If, if for a doctor level, there's a diplomat American Board of Neurophysiological Monitoring. You can take this test also. Uh, you need to have MD, PhD from accredited schools. Uh, you have to have at least three years of experience working uh, in the operating room uh, with uh, 300 surgeries done minimum and letter of recommendation, and you can take written part and oral part. So there are 165, 175 ABNM right now in the world. This is our first workshop we did. So we have like multiple workshops we did in 2005. The first one was in 2008. We did another one in 2012, 15, 16. And um, 
So very sturdy. So again, the loss is a teamwork. Uh, one person cannot do that. So it's always a teamwork between surgeon, neurophysiologic, neurophysiologist, uh, anesthesiologist, and nursing staff. So whatever changes we have, we inform them and we make sure nothing happens. Thank you.